What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Arnie's. We are three guys high on spice with nothing better to do. I'm Matt Johnson, and I am the Lasan Al Gaib. Shit, did I say that right? I'm Keith Baker, and my hand hurts. And I'm Austin Terry, and I don't know if this is true, but I've heard fear is the mind killer. You know what? I've heard that through Grapevine as well. On today's show, though, we're doing a deep dive into Denis Villeneuve's Dune. After being delayed by about a year, theater goers and HBO Max subscribers can finally watch this much anticipated film. But before we get into the dense world of Dune and the shenanigans of House Atreides, Austin, any big episodes our audience should be aware of? Yeah, there are. Last week, we talked about the entire Halloween franchise, but with a twist only the canon movies. So, Halloween from 1978, Halloween from 2018, and the newest release, Halloween Kills. What do you think of that new movie? Well, we thought it sucked, but I think that episode is pretty great, so you should go check that out. Definitely agree. What a garbo movie, but a fantastic episode. <laughs> so go enjoy that. Don't actually, you know what? Don't even watch Halloween Kills. Just listen to our thoughts. You'll get all you need to know out of it. With that, let's get into the main topic of the show. Dune was released in 1965 by Frank Herbert and found a mainstream audience very quickly. It has been called the highest-selling science fiction novel of all time, and it would go on to influence Star Wars and many other important franchises. Due to its dense lore, political storylines, huge cast of characters, as well as its scope and scale, many deem Dune impossible to adapt into a film. David Lynch, however, did so in 1984, but it was a commercial and critical failure. It was noted for staying faithful to the source material and has gone on to build a cult following. In addition to many sequel and prequel novels, video games, and comic books that have been released since, they have added lore and stories to the universe of Dune. However, in 2017, Denis Villeneuve, hot off sci-fi projects like Arrival and Blade Runner 2049, signed on to direct a new adaptation with the goal of making it in two parts. He assembled an all-star cast, another huge budget, and set off to make this ambitious project, and it was going to be the definitive version of Dune, and he even referred to it as the Star Wars for adults. Here we are, four years down the road, and we've experienced the first part of Villeneuve's Dune. After all the spilled up, how did we feel about it? Austin and Keith, without further ado, give me your expectations going in, as well as your non-spoiler thoughts on Dune. Expectations going in. I don't know if I really had much expectations. I think I maybe watched one teaser trailer, maybe the first trailer. And then it was pushed back, right? So I didn't really see yeah. or read anything about it for a long time. The only thing I knew about Dune was what, from what my dad told me about the old one, the 1984 version. Uh, he said it was really weird, but kind of cool, and that the sci-fi was uh, interesting. And um, so that's all I knew about it going in. I knew the cast, so I was looking forward to seeing my man, Jason Momoa, come back. To be honest, I really don't know where I stand yet as far as do I think this movie's good, bad, okay. I don't know. I feel like there's a lot to forget. I definitely want to go back and rewatch it. I think the sci-fi is really cool. The The story is really interesting, but maybe how they laid it out wasn't the best. So that's kind of where I'm at. Um, but I think the characters are cool. The story is cool. And I'm looking forward to more in this universe. Yeah, for me going into this one, I was super hyped for this movie. That first teaser trailer was incredible. They announced that incredible cast, Oscar Isaac, Rebecca Ferguson. I mean... There's so many big names in there, and I could not have been more excited to finally check this one out, especially after that year delay. I think it's a really, really good movie. I think it's incredibly well made. I think that all the performances are really great. The visuals are absolutely stunning. The sound design's incredible. Every aspect that makes a good movie is, is here in this film. I think the only issue I have with it is because we're waiting on a part two that's not greenlit, the story itself feels incomplete. And I think when part two gets here, it's going to retroactively make part one a better movie. But if part two never comes out, then I'm not sure how well just the standalone Dune part one is going to age. So um, I think it's a good movie. I think it's incomplete, but uh, I had a blast watching it. Yeah, this is an interesting one. I was able to watch Dune uh, a second time this weekend after we watched it. So that definitely helped. Watched on HBO Max, of course, so I had captions available to me. And I got to say that alone was a pretty big difference. Really helps you understand what's going on, the characters, just the random things they bring up out of nowhere. Certainly appreciated that. So it does kind of bring up the classic question of, I watched it the first time and was left wondering, I don't understand anything that's going on. Like they're not 
really explaining much of this. Is that a good thing? Is it good that it's an evil Niv is not kind of holding my hand through this adventure? So I don't know how I feel about that. So I think I might be closer to Keith when it came to the first viewing. Overall, though, I agree with Austin. Visuals and sound are absolutely outstanding. So good. I think my big issue is because they adapted the first half of Dune into this two and a half hour movie, it kind of left me feeling, okay, there was some really cool stuff in that. Liked a lot of the characters, liked a lot of the motivations, but it kind of feels like all the cool stuff is happening in part two. So I'm excited for that, but the ending of this one left me feeling a bit hollow because it's like, oh, okay, they set up a lot of cool stuff, but there's not really any resolution in this because in reality, it's only half of a very famous novel. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the excitement for part two there because um, I don't know if you guys have seen the 1984 Dune, no. but that movie... David Lynch actually views it as a failure. Like he views it as one of his worst movies because he shot and edited a three hour movie of his Dune, but he didn't have final cut and the studio cut it down to an hour and a half. So I am happy that like the ultimate goal for this project is a five hour Dune story. Um, I just think with this first part, they had to have so much world building, so much setup that if if part two doesn't happen, it's not going to be looked upon very fondly. I don't think. I don't know if you guys have seen the Dune book, but I actually own it. I haven't read it yet, but it's like, six inches thick. I mean, it's a huge, massive book. There's so much content to just try to get into one single movie. That's what it felt like going into this movie when it first started. I was like, I feel like we're already coming into a middle of a book. (laughs) It's like we should already already know all this stuff, but I don't know any of it. I definitely did appreciate the way they set up kind of the planets and the houses and the initial characters. That was all pretty cool. But then after that, it just becomes a lot. And it's... It's it's easy to grasp if you're ready for it, but it's just very dense. So, which I've heard the book itself is extremely dense. So you just have to kind of be ready for something like that. And if you're paying extreme attention, luckily, like I said, I watched it a second time. So it was a bit easier. Like, okay, now that makes sense. It didn't make sense when I first watched it. So it's one of those viewings. So it's like, did I love it the first time? Honestly, no. But the second time, I did appreciate it way more. The characters, the performances, the visuals, everything was great. It's just the story and the pacing that I have some issues with. Not going to get into spoilers yet, but that's kind of my non-spoiler thoughts. Definitely some questions in regards to how they told this story for the first part. I do think, though, for the visuals alone, you got to see this movie. You got to check this one out and decide for yourself if, if you like it or not. So it sounds like we all recommend Dune. Definitely some varying thoughts, some big questions left over. Will we get a sequel? Who the hell knows? But before we get into some deeper thoughts, we're going to drop the spoiler warning. So if you have not watched Dune, go check it out in theaters or HBO Max and then come on back to our review. And here we go, my friends. It is time to get deeper in. Let's explore the world of Dune, House Atreides, House Harkonnen, and the bam bam shaw 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 shaw. It is officially time for spoiler thoughts, but first, before we get into the details, it's time for the cast and crew breakdown. Austin, what do you have for me for the crew side of things? All right, so Dune, of course, is directed by Denis Villeneuve. You may know him from Prisoners, Enemy, Sicario, Arrival, and Blade Runner 2049. Our film is written by John Spates, Eric Roth, and Villeneuve as well. Spates is known for Prometheus and Doctor Strange, um, and Roth is known for Forrest Gump and A Star is Born. Our movie score is composed by Hans Zimmer, and of course, based on the book Dune by Frank Herbert. And going into our cast, we have Mr. Timothy Chalamet as Paul Atreides. Rebecca Ferguson as Lady Jessica, Oscar Isaac as Duke Leto Atreides, Josh Brolin as Gurney, Stellan Skarsgård as Baron Harkonnen, Dave Bautista as Robin, Zendaya as Chani, and Sharon Duncan Brewster as Dr. Leet Kynes, with Jason Momoa as Duncan Idaho and Javier Bardem as Stilgar. There's our cast and crew, guys. Any highlights, any positives, negatives, what you got? Um, I think I got to give my highlight to Oscar Isaac as Duke Leto Atreides. Loved his performance in this movie. Loved how likable he is, despite being this kind of powerful um, Duke of a house. Like, you can tell he occupies a lot of power in this region. Really enjoyed his character. Really enjoyed Oscar Isaac's performance. I loved his dynamic with both Lady Jessica and Paul Atreides. 
Um, and I also loved Oscar Isaac's hair in this movie. He's looking good. Yeah, I mean, I got a few positives here, but just to shout out one, I'll go with Rebecca Ferguson as Lady Jessica. thought she was really good in this movie. I don't really understand her character yet, but it seems like she's kind of like a double agent sort of thing. I could be wrong. But yeah, I just kind of like her relationship with uh, Paul and then also her relationship with that group, which I forget the name of. So um, yeah, I enjoyed her performance. Very interesting, guys. I was not expecting this because my two favorites in this movie were Oscar Isaac and Rebecca Ferguson. I was expecting a possible Jason Momoa shout out. He is really good. He's very good. He's very good. But you know what? I I have to do a bit of a cheat here. I think for the crew side of things, Hans Zimmer is one of the most prolific composers of all time. And somehow he outdid himself here. I think the score in this movie is just 10 out of 10. It's bonkers. It's so good. So he deserves a shout out. But to go with you guys, to go for the cast, I'm going to go for somebody that was barely on screen. But somehow, I don't know how this person does it, but they just really are able to inhabit roles. It doesn't matter if they're in the entire movie, like half of it or barely any of it. Javier Bardem is still Garman. Oh, I thought you were going to say Stellan Skarsgård. He was great. Everybody's great. I really do feel like everybody's great. But Javier Bardem specifically, I feel like they introduce him in the first scene, and it's very, he's the leader. He's kind of, they introduced earlier, he's kind of what Paul is. We talked about how Paul is not ready to be a leader, but if you answer that call, maybe you could be. It kind of seems like maybe Stilgar is the same thing. Maybe he didn't want to be the leader of the Freeman, but he is. And then later on, we see him at the very end to kind of oversee this duel of sorts. And his character in the sequel, that is what I am most excited to see next, because he's the leader of this group that we don't know that much about. His performance is fantastic. The way he delivers lines is, of course, incredible. And I cannot wait to see more from Mr. Javier Bardem. Yeah, really nice to see Javier bounce back from that Pirates movie. Um, I also do want to shout out Stellan Skarsgård, too, because he's terrifying when he's on screen, and I'm very interested to see what happens with this character in the sequel. And then back to Hans Zimmer real quick. I thought this was pretty interesting. So apparently uh, Hans Zimmer is a big fan of the novel Dune, and he actually turned down working with his frequent collaborator Christopher Nolan on Tenant last year because he wanted to compose the score for this film so badly. So sorry, Chris. You lost Hans Zimmer because Dune had to have him. So there you go. I'm glad it worked out, though, because that Tenet score is pretty great, too. So yeah. I'm, kinda, I'm glad they got two different scores out of both those relationships. Yeah, that movie sucked, but the score is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, too, because Denis Villeneuve has always wanted to make Dune, but he felt like he didn't have the sci-fi experience yet. So he waited to make Arrival and Blade Runner. And then he was like, OK, no, I'm ready. And I was actually reading that he... He used his interpretation of some of the Dune events, um, like the way he saw things in his mind in both Arrival and Blade Runner. So Dune is also still inspiring current sci-fi works today. So let's go ahead and get into the critical reception. So the big question has been, with Dune going to HBO Max and costing so much, will this be able to make enough money to actually warrant the sequel that they're trying to make? So here's what we know so far. Dune cost $165 million to make, and currently it has grossed $170 million. So it has made its budget back, but in order to break even due to marketing costs and production costs, they will need to make a little bit over $300 million. The film currently has an 83% on Rotten Tomatoes, the critical consensus being Dune occasionally struggles with its unwieldy source material, but those issues are largely overshadowed by the scope and ambition of this visually thrilling adaptation. Positive reviews praise the film's scope, scale, and ambition. Considering the source material, many found the visual elements to really live up to the book's legacy. The performances of the ensemble cast were also highlighted. Critics and audiences seemed to appreciate the absorbing atmosphere of the world. Both fans of the book and newcomers praised the world building. Villeneuve's work was universally praised when it came to executing his visual style. And lastly, the sound design was given high praise as well. The negative reviews focused on the fact that the movie mostly feels like world building and less of a singular story. Critics felt it ran out of storytelling steam and could be perceived as boring at parts. The pacing was controversial. It seems to go from plot beats to several moments of world building or character moments and the story could get lost. 
Leah Greenblatt of Entertainment Weekly said, quote, The sheer awesomeness of Villeneuve's execution often obscures the fact that the plot is mostly a prologue, a sprawling origin story with no fixed beginning or end. The movie is out to wow you more than it is to entertain you. Yeah, so definitely some very interesting points on both sides there. I wanted to get you guys to break it down. Did anything jump out to you when it comes to positive or negative? Because while the movie has been praised pretty universally, I would say, and some are even calling it a masterpiece, it sounds like even the people calling it a masterpiece have agreed on some of the negatives. So what do you guys think overall on some of these points here? I do definitely agree that it's mostly set up. That being said, though, I was never bored in this movie. So I don't know who's calling that out, because even if it is just people talking, where they're talking, the setting they're in is still like incredible to look at. When we do get to our action scenes, the action's really good. All the space scene is really cool. So everything about this movie, I think, is really engaging and compelling. I would certainly not use boring to describe this film. Maybe overbloated, but definitely not boring. Uh, I do agree that it does feel like a setup. I do agree with that, but I will agree with you, Austin, that, yeah, this movie is not boring at all. I think it's a great setup, if that's what, if that's what it's going to be. Uh, or a prologue, as, as she put it. Yeah, it's the frequent like MCU critique. It's like, yeah, these are fun newbies, but all we're doing is setting things up. Well, that's exactly what Dune Part 1's doing. We're setting it up for Part 2. I guess where I would disagree there is that the MCU movies kind of feel collectively like they're setting up for something. Whereas my only issue with Dune is it feels like it, this is the Part 1, and we know there's a Part 2. So Part 2 is it in terms of the original story. So it's kind of like, wow, okay, so two and a half hours to set everything up. Is the next movie going to be all of our answers, or is it going to be setting up for more? I don't really know. What I will say is the visuals are stunning. The sound design is incredible. That being said, I definitely agree with Keith that it does feel like by the time you get to the end, you're reflecting on what really happened in this one. And then you think about it, it's like, okay, that was cool. That was cool. Oh, wow. Yeah, that twist was cool. But at the same time, it's like, it feels like you were mostly building out the world. And while I appreciated it and it was interesting, I think I'm more excited for part two. And if we never get it, then that sucks. And if we do, I'm expecting to love that movie. But this one, it was like, okay, it took me a little bit to get into it because it felt very dense and setting up as opposed to just telling an interesting story. Because it's two and a half hours. If you, I feel like the main story was just twenty minutes of the two and a half hours. Like you could have just told it in a, like a very short form, and it would have been fine. But you know, to build up everything else, it takes a lot more time. So, kind of feeling a bit conflicted on that. Yeah, I'm really excited for the eventual supercut between Dune Part One and Part Two, and to watch the five and a half hour story of Dune. It is time to get a little bit deeper. Let's go ahead and get into our freeform discussion and break everything down. Will we understand everything? Probably not. But who wants to start us off? So we've touched on it a bunch. Um, this movie definitely is just a ton of world building, a lot of intro to characters and their relationships with other characters. I just wanted to get your thoughts on all the characters in this film, all the relationships, all the different houses. I'm frequently seeing this movie described as Game of Thrones in space. What are your thoughts on this sort of stuff? Yeah, I definitely can go along with your Game of Thrones in space thing because it was super confusing to keep up with all the families and all the names and what's going on in all the houses and kingdoms and all that kind of stuff. And I definitely kind of feel that in Dune here, especially coming in, like I said, I feel like we're coming in in the middle of a book where we already like should kind of know what these are. I did get a little bit confused by all these different names and what's going on with the planets and the space, the space guild and all that kind of stuff. I know it takes place in like 10,191 uh, AD or something like that. So it's pretty far in the future. So I'm just wondering how all this came about and what's going on with the lore here. As for the year, just like a random fun fact I saw, uh, the 10,191 is actually not AD as oh. I thought it was. So it's a new kind of uh, description. Calendar? Of the count, cal- yeah. So 10,000 is a post- when space travel became a thing. So if you go backwards in terms of what the like, novels have told us in Dune, we're actually in the year like 23,000 because it was like in, in 13,000 AD, space travel became a thing. So then they be- that became a new calendar 
and this story is 10,000 years after that. Oh, that's cool. 20,000 years from now. But that's the cool thing, is this is in our universe. This is not a Star Wars galaxy far, far away. This is our solar system, and that's pretty cool. Space travel is just a normal thing, and pretty interesting. So I appreciated that part of it. So what did you guys think of like kind of the relationship between the houses and the Galactic Empire? Because that's kind of the biggest crux of this film, is that there is a government... And then all these houses are kind of the different tiers of that government. Yeah, I guess that's what I got. I kind of, I kind of got confused by where are the Atreides uh, at in, on the totem pole. So here's what I got: it's like there's kind of the Galactic Empire, and then two of the most powerful houses are House Harakin, who used to be in control of Arrakis and all the spice mining. They became insanely rich, and then kind of the other house there is House Atreides, which is also an equally powerful house, and. At the beginning of the movie, it seems like they're favored by the Galactic Empire because the Empire has given them control of Heracles and kicked House Heracanen out. On the second watch, I realized um, whenever Dave Batista comes in to talk to his uncle, uh, the Baron Harkonnen, he's like, why the hell did they kick us out? Like, we were giving them money. We were rich. What's going on? And then David Asmalchian is like, well, you know, a gift's not necessarily a gift. Doesn't mean it's out of love. And he's like, what does that mean? And so it seems as though the Emperor, very similar to Star Wars, we're talking about an Emperor who we never actually see in the first movie, very similar. It seems that the Emperor is a bit jealous of Leto Atreides. It's like that house is rising to power, and I don't like that. And I think they established House Atreides as pretty like beloved on their planet. Definitely on their planet, but just in general, it sounds like the universe is pretty big on House Atreides. They're pretty beloved, and the Emperor is jealous. I I believe the word jealous is used by Harkonnen to describe how the Emperor feels about uh, Leto Atreides coming to power. So he's like, the Emperor doesn't like that, so he's kind of setting them up to fail, which becomes a big plot point of Duncan Idaho talks about that. Whenever shit goes to hell, it's like, okay, so we were set up to fail. Lady Jessica's like, we were set up to fail. So that's kind of the thing. So the Emperor, we never see them, but it seems like despite Atreides being loved, they are not being favored by the Emperor himself, and they are being kind of uh, (laughs) set up to be killed. And that's actually kind of one of my favorite things about Dune Part 1 is Keith used the term earlier, it feels like we're joining in the middle of a book. I kind of like that. That's where we're starting is with all this established war, all this established history. Like I I like coming in and feeling like there is history and relationships I'll probably never see, but I like knowing that it's kind of all there and it all plays into these relationships. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Yeah, I say it started in the middle of a book. I'm not saying that's a necessary problem, though. I did I did like that. It was already there. We don't really need too much origin stories here. I agree. I do think, despite that, there are issues and there are weird lines of dialogue that whenever I first watched it, I was like, that's weird. Did I hear that right? And then watching it later with captions, I was like, Okay, I definitely heard that right. What does that mean? So, like, whenever we get to the, I guess, infamous uh, dinner scene where uh, Duke Leto has been poisoned and he is stripped and he is paralyzed in his chair and then Baron Harkonnen is sitting across from him, he says, wow, what a feast this is, cousin. And it's like, what is that? It turns out they are related. Never mentioned earlier. Seems kind of like a bigger deal than they let on in the movie and in the story. And there are some elements of Lady Jessica being, of course, related to the Bene Gesserit, like the weird kind of uh, put your hand in the box, uh, Paul, like that kind of group. And how does that relate to the Harkonnens? Because we see her talking to the Baron later. So that's something they established is the Bene Gesserit are this other faction kind of among these big three in in our first movie. Yeah. And they're this kind of warrior space priestesses who are very selective in who they let in it's typically only women um, and they like harness their mind and bodies to essentially have superpowers they say they serve as advisors to the government but in reality they have their own agenda they've been doing this like selective breeding thing and are waiting for kind of like their messiah to be born right and so the fact that jessica fell in love with leto was kind of a big deal and Leto wanted to have a son who I guess would be able to be the heir to his name and Jessica was like I will allow that was kind of a big deal because normally they would prefer her to have a girl still some weird stuff of like out of nowhere Harkonnen being like 
what a great feast, cousin. It's like, okay, never knew they were related. Stuff like that doesn't really bother me, though, because that plot of them being related could have been like 45 minutes of the movie. But having sure. that line is like, okay, we're, they're related. We can move on now. Like, it, it clearly wasn't essential to the plot of the film. That's true. It wasn't essential. It still felt weird. But I guess they'll probably explain it in part two. So, you know. We talk about kind of the characters, the world building, all that good stuff. But how do you guys feel about the pacing of it? Of course, this is like a two and a half hour movie without credits. In some ways, it kind of feels like we're doing a quick story beat. And then after that, it's like, okay, here are a bunch of world building scenes or some character scenes. Did we ever get bored or feel like what they were showing was dull? How do you feel about the pacing overall is my question for you. I don't know. I think it was paced well for me. Um, I, it didn't feel like it was a two and a half hour movie. It felt a lot shorter. I don't know. I like every. I think every every piece of it had its had its moment, and yeah, I don't think I had any problems with it. Yeah, I, I think for the most part the pacing was fine. I think I certainly wasn't ever bored, like we said. But where I did notice kind of some wonky pacing is right when the movie starts wrapping up. It feels like we should still have like three hours left, which I guess we do. But this movie wraps up in like fifteen minutes, and it's like okay. I guess we're done. <laughs> yeah. We're walking into the desert. Opposite of uh, Casino Royale, where <laughs> it just goes on and on. <laughs> That's very true. Here's all this It's detail. literally just like, hey, Zendaya's here, and then credits. It really does feel like that, because she was like the main figure of the marketing, and she's the opening narration of the movie. <laughs> so it's like, oh, Zendaya, I love Zendaya. And then it's like, do you love Zendaya? Well, don't watch Dune unless you only want four minutes of her. <laughs> It's Mary Jane. <laughs> MJ! MJ! Um, yeah, this is a weird one for me. I don't know if I've ever had this specific complaint when it came to pacing before. Because I'm totally with you, Keith. This movie is two and a half hours. Certainly, certainly didn't feel like it. Absolutely flew by, like you said, Austin. But when you like think about individual scenes, it's like, okay, maybe that was paced weird. It is kind of weird that Gurney Halleck is kind of a cool character played by Josh Brolin, like introduced like smile Gurney. It's like, I am smiling. It's like, oh, okay, what does that mean? And then we next see him just like, oh, hey, Paul, I know you love Duncan Idaho, but now I'm your sword master. It's like, oh, okay, cool. I guess Duncan Idaho is a sword master. I didn't know that because I haven't read Dune before. <laughs> and then <laughs> later it's like, oh, Duncan Idaho's back. He really loves Paul. Oh, look, they're hugging. Like they, they're big. They're good friends. And then Duncan is like, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Fremen, Paul. Like you're going to love them too. And then like 45 minutes go by. And then the next shot we see of Duncan is just him walking down a dark hallway about to fight people after like all the bad guys have come. It's like there was no setup shot to it. There's no shot of him waking up. It's just oh, I forgot about him and he's walking down the hall to fight. It's just there is some weird choices with like how they handle the ensemble cast. Like, oh, it's almost like Daniel was like, oh fuck. Like we need to cut back to that person or that person. Um yeah, so that was my big issue in terms of that. It was like I forgot about that. They didn't set up that up very well. Who is that person? Why do they care about Paul? Why do they care about... What is their role in the Atreides family? But then most of them die, so it's just like, should I care? I'm not 100% sure. So very weird. On that note, I was going to bring this up later, but there are so many characters, and there's so much lore to get to in this movie. Yeah. Should this... We've mentioned Game of Thrones. Should this have just been an HBO Max show? I think I would have preferred that personally. I think I would like that, too. Do, like, three seasons, really get into everything. Well, y'all mentioned earlier that they're going to do, like, a, a full cut of both movies together. It's like, well, why not just push this release date back again and just do one <laughs> and just do one full cut movie, like a six-hour movie that shows everything you want to show? I think studios still don't think people go to a theater for six hours. And they're they're probably right, yeah. I mean, it's it's only recently that movies have been really able to come out and be almost three hours long in theaters. Like like I said, with David Lynch's Dune in 84, his cut was three hours and they cut it to an hour and a half. Yeah, there's still a weird kind of a box office element to that. It's like we can release Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings movies in theaters, but we have to keep in mind that they're only going to make X amount of money because we can only we can show it like half the amount of times because it's twice as long as everything else. So do we want to do that in theaters? And we want to make Dune Part 2, 
But if Denny's cut is that long, then we can't show it as many times. So it's kind of a weird thing. And according to Momoa, Keith, there is a six hour cut of Dune Part One. I did read, though. I did read today that Denis said, and I'm not I'm not joking. He literally said, I love Jason, but that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> he basically he wasn't saying that there wasn't more footage. It was like Dini was saying, "Yes, we filmed a lot of footage, but I never was going to include that in the final cut. Like once we got to editing, was never going to include that. So what you saw in theaters or HBO Max is what I wanted you to see. So that's kind of good for the last few years. People like us being like." Is there going to be a Snyder cut? Denis was like, yeah, I shot more, but I don't want you to see it. Like, what you saw, there you go. That's a Dune. He also probably was like, I love Jason, but he was on set for two days. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I f- is his name Jason? I kind of forgot what his name was. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked about it. Everyone's seen it. The critics are raving about it. The visuals are absolutely stunning in this movie. The action, on the other hand, is a little wonky for me. They're in these kinetic barriers. They, like, stutter and freeze. It makes it seem like your TV's breaking when they're fighting. Did it feel as weird for you guys as it did to me? I will say real quick that the one thing, like I said, didn't love the movie the first time I watched it. Second time, really, really liked it. The one thing that I did not, my opinion did not change on was the kinetic barriers and the shield. I still am very unclear on how this works. Like, Gurney has lines where he's like, ugh, the slow blade cuts through. And it's like, okay, so I have a kinetic shield on. If somebody, like, comes at me and then somehow gets, like, a slow blade at me, that'll cut through me. But then it's like, why would that happen? How would that happen? And then we see later in the movie that doesn't happen. Duncan gets stabbed very quickly <laughs> and dies. So I just don't really fully understand how the shields are. I don't know if that's a book thing or was Austin and I were talking, was the shields a way to make the movie not R-rated, not to have blood? They're like, we'll have like these blue and red shields. Well, that'll make it PG-13. I don't know. All I know is they didn't love it. It looked weird as hell. It made sense during the gurney and Paul like practice. Yeah. It totally did. Yeah, but during like the the combat or the like the other violent scenes, where especially whenever uh, Leto gets shot with the uh, the dart in the back, yeah, well that shouldn't have gone through. No, <laughs> but it did exactly. <laughs> so what, what are these shields for? <laughs> in that scene, though, you see him like it's hovering in his barrier. You see him trying to get to it, but because of where the placement is, he can't reach it. So I wonder if you just have like a certain amount of time before your your barrier breaks. We got to talk about the main praise thing. The visuals beyond that, the production design, the way the worlds look, how they look different, the way the ships look, the way they fly, all that good stuff. That, I would say, was an easy 10 out of 10 for me. Looked gorgeous. I was surprised at just how real and functional it looks. Like, it doesn't look outlandish. Like, it, it, it looks like it works. All the ships, like, it doesn't look CGI. It's just stunningly, like, realistic. Yeah. The explosions too, whenever that big ass shit comes in at the end and, or maybe not the end, but in the middle, whenever they're uh, being attacked um, by that big ass ship that's still in space and all the explosions hitting the ground, you can just feel the vibrations of those explosions and the way they looked, uh, which is awesome. And that's also a point where the barriers looked really cool too, with the bombs hitting, but they're over buildings. So the bombs are slowing down. Mm -hmm. I thought the barriers there looked really great. Yeah. Yeah. That was cool. That was cool. Was there any like specific moment that you were like, wow, it looks awesome? There was one I thought was really cool and it, it showed off scale really well, but it's when you see the Harakonin ships in orbit above Arrakis and it's this massive ship and you see just this this tiny little circular pod coming out of it, but then that same pod comes down and it looks ginormous yeah. away from that ship. It was just such a good realization of being like, wow, that ship is massive. One scene that stood out for me was whenever the worm swallows the... Uh the spice refinery machine. So cool. Yeah. So cool. I thought that was really cool. That's probably one of my favorite parts of the movie. Something I like about that scene too is like Leto is the one that wants to save these people, not Paul. I feel like in a lot of other stories like this, it would be Leto who's the bad guy and Paul is the son who needs to learn that his father's bad. 
But I like that Leto is actually good and he cares about the people working for him and he's driving everybody else to be like, fuck the spice, let's save the people. I really like the character of Leto in this movie. Yeah, and they really did a good job of setting up even the little things about him when he was like, I want, I want to go to Arrakis. And it's like, Paul, shut the fuck up. You can't go to Arrakis. Like, you are the son of the Duke. Like, that's not politically sound. And he's like, but I want to. And it's like, look, here's the thing you can't. And he's like, but grandfather fought bulls. And he's like, yeah, and he died doing it. <laughs> and then, of course, Leto's like, look, here's the thing. We all want to do things that, like, that aren't Duke related. I wanted to be a pilot. And then we get to see Leto actually pilot the ship to go after, you know, the sand crawler or whatever, which was pretty cool pretty fun just little things like that really added to the character so they found a way to actually take the visual elements of the story and make them add to the characters make you feel more endeared to them which i didn't expect either because that's a very hard thing to do so that was super cool it's probably time to talk about our main character here of course timothy chalamet as paul he is our pov character how do we feel about him in general i want to hear what you guys thought about not just the character but also his performance because he's the one. This book was written in the 60s, so the idea of the one being kind of a newer thing is super cool to think about. And then his journey throughout the film. Of course, there's more to look forward to in the future, but what did we think of Paul just in the first half of Dune? I really like this character. Um, I, I like the aspect of, I'm the son of a duke, but I don't necessarily want to be in a leadership role. Later, I find out I'm the Messiah. What did my mother do that I don't know about? Like, I like all this confusion and how he is kind of figuring out everything he's capable of and, and what he's supposed to be doing. I also like by the end of the film, he's a little bit more comfortable in this leadership role now that his father is dead. I think he's got a great arc in this movie for sure. And I like that he can be compassionate like his father. He's also a really smart guy. Like you see him watching all these infographics about like the place he's in, and you can just tell that he wants to be prepared for every situation he's in. Yeah, I liked him too. I think you nailed it on the head, Austin. He's like kind of mixed up. I mean, he's kind of conflicted in some ways with the the weird Messiah stuff from his mom's side, and then he has like the leadership role uh, thing coming from his dad's side. And he and his like maturity is kind of like like back and forth too. Like he's all of a sudden like thinking really logically about certain situations and then like the next second he's like Duncan and he goes like hugs Duncan and then like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just like little like a little boy it's like he, he's kind of uh I don't know he's an interesting character I'm looking forward to his journey and the hand thing I, that that scene really got me I thought that was a really cool scene when he sticks his hand into the uh the little box and the lady's holding a needle at his neck and just to kind of test him and he passed the test it was really cool watching that scene the second time and just really appreciating the way he and that scene goes from i would say a little boy in terms of like how he's reacting to pain to he's clearly feeling pain you can see tears in his eyes but then he kind of accepts it he almost smirks and just like repositions himself to look at her and is like this fucking sucks this hurts but i'm not going to let you <laughs> kill me right now man like no way and it's really pretty badass. Um, I think Paul is really cool. And I was not expecting to like this character as much as I did. You guys kind of nailed it. He has the nobility of his father. And he has the compassion of his mother. But he also has kind of the darker sides of both of his parents as well. Like Leto didn't really have much of a path if that makes sense. Like, he was clearly, okay, my dad died fighting a bull. The ring is mine. I have to, you know, be the leader. So he kind of has that same path, but the way his mother, who's a concubine and shouldn't be what we expect, he also has a very different relationship with her. And then the way he has kind of the perceived compassionate moments from his mom, I mean, watching him in... Uh, the throne room, if you want to call it that, like the council, I guess, whenever Stilgar comes for the first time. And it's like, Stilgar's like, Javier Bardem is like, I'm here because it's honorable, but I mean, what can you offer me? You guys take all of our spice, you invade our areas, and that's it. And then everybody's trying to be very like, oh, well, yeah, oh, hold on, hold on. And then Paul's like, yeah, that's true. This is a really interesting character. And the way he kind of inhabits both Oscar Isaac and Rebecca Ferguson's roles and kind of moves forward by the end where he puts the ring on. And it's like, 
are going forward to Dune Part 2, and you know that he's going to have both those qualities, and that you can even see the Fremen are like, they see that in him too, is like, okay, this is pretty cool. Looking forward to it. A desert, I would say, is not the most exciting setting for a sci-fi movie. Look at Tatooine. You guys know how much I hate Tatooine <laughs> in Star Wars. Ah, the sand. <laughs> what did you think of Arrakis uh, for kind of our main setting for the film? Uh, I liked it. Well, it definitely fits with the title, obviously, Dune. But um, I think it made sense for what they're trying to tell in the story with the spices and they got this worm thing, like a trimmer, like Kevin Bacon sort of thing running around. <laughs> <laughs> and they got to get to the rocks and all that. Um, yeah, I think I think it worked for me. And, and the way that the uh, like the city looked within the within the sand did look really cool. It's like they took Maz Eisley, Tatooine, and like put it on steroids and just made it look really good. Or maybe George Lucas took Arrakis and made Tatooine. Maybe George Lucas isn't as creative no! as we think. No, Anakin. Maybe George Lucas is a thief. <laughs> Not George. <Annie. laughs> I hate sand. <laughs> of course. Uh, Hayden Christensen would have died on set of this film. <laughs> <laughs> There's too much sand. <laughs> Going back to like Star Wars and what your question was, Austin, I I do hope we get like a more like Naboo looking planet, like a green planet or something with a different landscape. Yeah, for sure. I think it was really kind of goofy. My least favorite line was, I think Duke Leto was saying to Paul, we have air power and sea power on Kaladin, but we need desert power. And I was like, is he just trying to talk to a, like a five-year-old? Is that how he's trying to read this line? <laughs> because Paul isn't that. And then later they say, we need desert power. And it's like, oh, I guess, <laughs> I guess that's how they're wording it. Um, but that kind of reminds me of the spice itself. So I'll be honest, when we first watched it, it kind of passed me by. And really, the only description of the spice is in the first like maybe 20 minutes of the movie where they have narration, but they say, so spice for the Fremen, it makes us, it gives us our blue eyes, of course, and it gives us health benefits and all that good stuff. But then also very differently, people harvest it because navigators need it so that they can perceive essentially space travel, like interstellar travel, the way they can like traverse the path. They need to be, on spice so that they can do that safely. Did that work for you guys? Because for me, like I said, it kind of took me until the second try watching the movie to go be like, okay, so I guess spice has health benefits, but then also it's for space travel. I just totally missed it the first time. I got it the first time, but it still is very confusing. Like in the next movie, I think I'm going to need them to explain why spice works both ways and like how they're actually using it for the intergalactic pilots. I think it would have made a lot more sense if they had tweaked it a little bit and said, Spice is a hallucinogenic, but it also powers our engines and makes space travel capable. Like it allows long distance space travel as yeah. opposed to also our navigators take it and now they can see a path through the stars. Our space travelers need it to traverse the stars, but also... It makes you high as fuck. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> it's like, it's so weird. I really like the uh, the ending fight scene with Paul and the dude from Stilgar's uh, group. So cool. I really liked how Lady Jessica pointed out that Paul's never killed anybody because he hesitated. He fucking beat him. He beat him twice. Yeah. yeah. And Stilgar's like, no, th your boy does not understand the rules of our group. You must kill. There is no yield. Well, I'm glad you brought this up, Keith, because we haven't actually talked about this yet. This is a good kind of leading into Dune Part 2 thing, but Paul's dreams. He dreams, of course, a lot about Arrakis before he ever gets there. He dreams a lot about Zendaya, the, the Chani character, of course. Uh, and sometimes there's one dream he has where she kills him while they're kissing. Like, she m murders him. And then there's another one where it's like, that's not the case. And... He has one dream that really stood out to me on the second watch specifically because the opening shot where Zendaya is doing the narration, we see Jamis, the character that Paul duels with at the end. He's one of the ones holding the gun. I think it's a gun. Maybe I'm wrong there. But he's like watching the Dune Harvester. Like, so he's in the opening. Like, we see him very early on, right? And then 
Paul has a, another dream. They're talking about friends. And he has another dream. And he sees Janice talking to him. I'm going to show you the ways of the desert. And then we get to the end. And he has to duel this guy in real life. And he kills him. And the idea of Paul's dreams not always being 100% true is pretty interesting to me. And even if you kind of look into it further, it's like we saw a vision of Jamis like, and Paul being really close friends. And he's like, you and I are buddies. I'm going to show you the way the desert. I'm going to show you the path. And then you can look forward to the duel and it's like, he kind of inadvertently maybe showed him that way because they're fighting to the death. He's showing him the way of the desert, but it's not the same thing. I wonder if, it, if he's seeing like multiple options of like, depending on what actions he takes, maybe this could happen. That's what it seems like a little bit. Yeah. Either way, it's cool because I'm with you, Keith. That ending was really awesome. It was a pretty cool, almost anti-climax in like, Wow, after this huge kind of uh, initial setup and then there's this big action set piece in the middle, you would have thought there would be something bigger. But then it's like, oh, no, it's just this really small, intimate fight scene (laughs) where they're fighting for honor at the very end. And they do that. Paul wins. And then it's like, okay, mom, come on. We're with them. And then it ends. And it's like part two is coming. It's like. That's kind of different (laughs) from literally everything we ever see. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And the fight scene was great. Like you guys have called out. And I am also excited to see Paul and Stilgard's relationship grow in part two. So despite titling the movie on screen as Dune part one, it should be noted that part two has not been officially greenlit. So there is no guarantee it will happen. The film needs to perform decently in theaters, but it sounds like if it has a large HBO Max following, a sequel could be made regardless. Volnov has said that he wouldn't have signed on in the first place to make just one film since the world was too dense. And in the last few days, Anne Sarnoff, the CEO of Warner Brothers, seemed to confirm they were planning a sequel and their writing process had begun, according to Villeneuve. And all we know is that Villeneuve has said Chani will have a much larger role in the sequel, and he is planning a third film, surprisingly, based on the novel Dune Messiah to close out his story. After watching this first film, are you guys excited about the sequel and the potential world of the Dune film with Villeneuve overseeing it? Absolutely. I hope this becomes the new Star Wars. I hope there's a ton of these movies. I hope they find ways to tell interesting stories within the world, like kind of like Rogue One. Like I could see spinoff movies like that taking place in the Dune universe. I think that'd be really cool, too. Um, I need Warner Bros. to at least make one smart decision and green light a sequel. They've fucked up the DC universe. They're terrible decision makers. They don't know what people want. At least make one right decision and give us Dune Part 2. Don't leave us with just Dune Part 1. I totally agree. I'm definitely excited for more. And I think this this has potential, like you said, Austin, to be the next Star Wars or Star Trek, um, whatever you want to call it, uh, sci-fi adventure. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting more into the story, learning more about it, seeing more planets, see what, seeing what this universe is about. I think it's cool that it takes place in our universe like earth's universe uh just way far in the future and um yeah i'm that's all i have to say i'm excited yeah and honestly just like to simplify it the things that i'm looking forward to really are zendaya and javier bardem these characters that have clearly such a big standing in the fremen i want to see how paul and rebecca ferguson's characters lady jessica can fit into that what does that look like and the fact that this will be a second film that resolves the initial setup of the first Dune novel seems like it's going to be pretty exciting. Will it be two and a half hours? Will it be three and a half? (laughs) Who the hell knows? But I can't wait regardless. I'm going to see this next one in theaters because Denis Villeneuve keeps asking us to, so we have to. So they are actually also making a prequel TV series on HBO Max called Dune The Sisterhood. It will center on the Bene Gesserit. Villeneuve will direct the pilot. Any interest in this new story from the world of Dune in TV form? And of course, this will be a prequel to the film we just watched. Of course. All I want to do is know more about this world. I'm definitely planning to go check out the book. Um, It's weird. This seems to be like a new strategy for Warner Bros. Like they're doing a movie and then having a show come out to support the movie. It's exactly what they're doing with the Batman and that Gotham series that they're launching with Matt Reeves. So interesting new strategy. Would love to see what it looks like. Can't wait to see a trailer. 
and definitely going to check it out. Yeah, I'll check that one out as well. I'm with you, Austin. I want to see more about this world and see what it has to offer. Yeah, my thing is the fact that Villeneuve is involved, the writers are involved, the producers are involved. Sounds good to me. I know they've pushed back on HBO Max in general, but the fact that we're getting TV series based on just elements of the Dune overall story is pretty cool to me. And honestly, I hope this isn't the last one because the B'nai Gesserit, Lady Jessica's involvement with that, and of course, Paul's extension, his involvement with that, pretty interesting. And if they do more stories, I'm pretty down. So Dune really could be a new huge HBO Max property in general, just based on the stories they choose to tell in TV form. So we'll see what happens. I'm definitely looking forward to this first one, though. I hope so, man. I mean, I also know that like Frank Herbert's son also wrote Dune books and added to the universe both sequels and prequels. So there's a ton of stuff out there to adapt. It's not like just the Dune book is all there is. Um, so there, there's definitely ways to keep this universe growing. But all right, while Brian Herbert is writing the next Dune prequel or sequel novel, our mission is to give an award. So, Austin or Keith, what are you feeling passionate about? What are you feeling deserves a call out? There is, there is somebody that deserves an award. And his name is Timothy Chalamet as Paul. He's going to be getting the Snuggliest Boy Award. Hmm. He's hugging everybody. Anybody he encounters, he's got to give a hug to. He's a big bear hugger. He loves to snuggle. You can tell this man likes a good blanket. He likes to cozy up with the people he likes. He definitely is the snuggliest boy. All right. I'm going to be giving the Kevin Bacon Tribute Award to Lady Jessica and Paul uh, for running from those worms, or you could call them tremors, heading for the rocks each time. I think they did a good job. Uh, so they're getting the Kevin Bacon, Kevin Bacon Tribute Award. I'm going to go ahead and give the biggest tease award. Uh, pretty simple. Oscar Isaac was full on nakey nakey in that dinner scene. And his leg, although he was paralyzed, his leg was covering his junk. And I know <laughs> there was some boys and gals out there that were like, come on, move that left <laughs> leg. <laughs> and he certainly didn't. He died without showing off his donger. That's all I know. Uh, so the biggest tease, of course, is going to Oscar Isaac. I do think this is the sexiest Oscar Isaac has ever looked, <laughs> is in this movie. The beard was a good call, I gotta say. The beard's looking good. The beard's looking hot. Thank you, everybody, so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and this series, make sure you hit that follow button so you never miss an episode. Please leave us a review as well, even if you don't want to write anything, leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get the podcast really does help us out. At The Arnie's is our social, and thearnies.media is the website. We'll be back next week to close out the spooky season with round two of our Halloween bracket. Oof, this is a big one. I cannot wait. Last year, we all picked movies to battle out for the title of the best Halloween movie. And now we have 12 new movies from a variety of different genres to see what the next movie to earn the title will be. My friends, are we excited about this? I can't wait. I've discovered a few new movies that I've loved throughout Ooh. this bracket. First time seeing some of them. I also found a new movie that I actually found very scary. So I'm excited to talk about a bunch of these films. Have you found one that you've hated, Austin? I found a few. <laughs> found a few. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would, because I just watched one of, uh, I'm not going to say whose it was. Yeah, no, that's not name any uh, movies, but just Yeah, I'll just, I just watched one that I, I was like, oh man, this is not as good as I thought it was uh, back in the day when I first watched it. Yeah, I'm really interested about this one. I'm excited to watch. We've watched so many movies. I've watched a couple at this point that I had not seen before, and I have a couple more to watch that I hadn't seen before. So we'll see what happens. All I know is last year was a bit more traditional. This year, we're coming at it from a bunch of different angles. So what's going to win the best Halloween movie? No idea. All I know is I cannot wait to record this episode. Lastly, we want to hear from you, so please send us a message on Instagram at the Arnie's or email us, thearniesmedia at gmail.com. Let us know your thoughts on Dune, the Halloween series, and what you hope to see on our Halloween theme bracket next week. Anything you say, we'll read on the show and react to it live on our latest episode. All right, everybody, we'll see you next week for the Halloween bracket to close out the month. Have a good week. Enjoy Halloween. Dress up. Have a good time. Enjoy your candy. We'll see you then. 
See ya. George Lucas is a fraud. 